The year is 1183, and with the death of the young King Henry, John would benefit the most. The immediate consequence was an intense grieving period for King Henry and Queen Eleanor. Although not together, as Eleanor was still under house arrest for her part in the uprising against the elder King Henry. The plans King Henry had made were now cast into the wind. His treaty with the French king was now worthless. Dividing his lands between his sons would have to be redrawn. King Henry's grief over his son and heir's death was tremendous, no doubt amplified by his refusal to see his dying son over fears that the young king's dying days was a trap. The young king was a popular chap, and without him, the uprising soon quelled bar one baron who would only surrender to the king personally. Yet a king such as Henry has little time to mourn and must see to the running of his kingdom. King Henry headed to Angers to meet with Richard and Geoffrey. These two sons of Henry were already starting to make a name for themselves. Richard was developing his reputation as a soldier from fighting rebels in his duchy of Aquitaine. And Geoffrey, who by one account is described as, for Geoffrey of Brittany, although the wiliest and most plausible of all the king's sons, was also the most generally distrusted and disliked. While King Henry began revising his plans for his surviving sons, he sent word to John to sail for Normandy. While the young King Henry's death was not a crippling blow to the Angevin Empire, it did create new tension with the French king. However, this was not the French king Henry had bested time and time again. No, this was a new young French king with grand ambitions to change France forever and would become a reoccurring foe for the Angevins, especially for John. The new French king was Philip II, or also known as Philip Augustus, for his later achievements. His father, Louis VII, had died in 1180 from the effects of a stroke. Philip was only 15 when he became senior king. Philip had one policy towards the Angevins, to break them. The young King Henry's widow was also the French king's sister, and Philip demanded that King Henry return her dowry. The issues were settled at a peace conference, and for future reference, there is going to be a lot of peace conferences between the Angevins and the French king. King Henry's next plan was a simple reshuffle of which sons get what land and titles, although this time there would be no junior king. The plan was simple. Richard, now the eldest son, would inherit England, Normandy, and Anjou. Geoffrey would still retain Brittany, as he was married to the ruler of Brittany, Constance. And for John, in addition to the lands he had in Cornwall and Gloucestershire, he would be granted the Duchy of Aquitaine. An easy to follow plan, there was just one problem. Richard had fought hard to control this unruly duchy for the last eight years. He was not going to give it up after all that effort. Besides fighting to maintain the duchy, Richard had also given homage to his liege lord, the King of France. Henry's jurisdiction over the duchy had ended when he gave it to Richard. And for Richard, what would he gain? A hollow title, perhaps, or a frustrating, lackluster role which Richard saw his elder brother struggle with. Richard would not concede the duchy, and he left his father's court for Poitou. At first, Henry's reaction to Richard's decision was tempered, even for a king whose anger and wrath were legendary when he didn't get his own way. But eventually, King Henry's short patience ran out, and he gave orders to Geoffrey and John to take the Duchy of Aquitaine by force. John's age at this point during the campaign into Aquitaine 
is a point of contention. Some of our sources give different ages for John, with the youngest age being 15 and the eldest 18. Regardless of John's age, Geoffrey would be the one to lead this force, and this would also be John's first military campaign. The initial plan to push Richard out failed, and Geoffrey and John resorted to conducting raids across Richard's lands. Richard responded in kind by launching his own harrying of Brittany. When word got to King Henry of his boys fighting, he summoned them to England to end the matter. And regardless of how the boys felt over journeying to England to meet face to face, the scary prospect of angering their father was enough for them to obey the summonings. Although Henry did use Eleanor as a bargaining chip to lure Richard. By February 1185, two incredibly important visitors arrived from the Holy Lands of Jerusalem to visit King Henry's court, the Patriarch of Jerusalem and the Grand Master of the Knights, a testament to Henry's prestige and renown. The two men were here to acquire military aid, meeting the king at Reading, where King Henry's grandfather, Henry I, was entombed. During the meeting, the patriarch begged the King of England for help, placing important symbols of the Kingdom of Jerusalem at his feet, including the standard of the kingdom, and beseeched Henry to take up the mantle and lead a military expedition to save the kingdom, a crusade. The whole assembly wept with the patriarch, and the king himself was deeply moved. John himself sought to join this potential crusade, pleading with his father to take up the cross. King Henry refused John's request, as he had other plans for him in Ireland. Whatever King Henry's initial reaction to the plea, like any wise king, Henry sought the advice of his council. They met at London on March 18th, 1185. To summarize the meeting, they deemed that a crusade was not in the best interests of the Kingdom of England, also adding that the King's presence was always needed to establish stability in the realm. Relations for the next few months were peaceful. John would head to Ireland, having been granted Lordship of Ireland, and would return in 1186. But in the same year, another shocking death to the sorrow of King Henry and Queen Eleanor. In August, Geoffrey, Duke of Brittany, died in a tournament in Paris or of sudden illness. Not only was he grieved for by his parents, but also the King of France, Philip. He and Geoffrey were close friends. After Geoffrey's grand funeral, organized by the French King, the issues of the wardship of Geoffrey's two daughters and his unborn child became a center point of conflict between Henry and Philip. Once again, John found himself near to the center of his father's plans and was only one sibling's death away from being the only male heir to the whole of the Angevin Empire. For John, the Lordship of Ireland would fade into the background for now. The issue of Brittany and the wardship of Geoffrey's children lingered on and soon started to turn into open warfare between Henry and Philip. Despite two peace conferences, which only achieved a few months of peace and realistically was more time for each side to build up their forces. By the summer of 1187, King Philip was on the warpath. While these political affairs were ongoing, Geoffrey's widow, Constance, gave birth to a son named Arthur, a potential heir. As Richard was still unmarried and John had no children, after another failed peace conference, Henry organized the defense of his realm by ordering four war parties to be commanded by four lieutenants one of Henry's bastard sons, Geoffrey the Bishop of Lincoln, John 
Richard and William de Mandeville, the Earl of Essex. Once again, the Angevin showed that by working together, they could overcome any external threat, as both John and Richard moved their forces into the province of Berry in anticipation of Philip's forces, which soon arrived and besieged the town of Chateroux. John and Richard saw to the defense of the town while King Henry marched his forces to aid his sons. It seemed a climactic battle was on the horizon. But instead of fighting, both sides sought diplomacy, as the danger of death in battle could see both sides potentially lose a king. Two weeks of back and forth discussions ended with a truce that was to last for two years thanks to the clergy. With both parties satisfied, they went their separate ways, apart from Richard, who made the decision to leave with the King of France, despite after nearly fighting him. King Henry, after the initial shock, soon grew suspicious of Richard traveling with the French king. After all, two of his now deceased sons had allied with the French king in the past, so Henry was right to be suspicious. But all the quarreling between father and son would soon fade with news from the Holy Lands. The Crusaders had been utterly defeated in battle against the forces of Saladin. Even worse news was to follow for the Christians. Jerusalem had been captured. Richard immediately swore to join a crusade. King Henry's reaction to Richard's declaration was not of anger, but shock. It is alleged that for the next four days, after learning of Richard's intentions, he shut himself away from the world, speaking to no one, perhaps contemplating to himself over and over again what might happen if Richard was to leave, or worse, die during the crusade. It's unknown what John thought of the news, although Richard would later state he wanted John to travel with him on the crusade, which John may have agreed to given his earlier enthusiasm. But despite the ongoing rally cry for nobles to join the crusade and finance it, Henry and Philip were still at odds with each other, yet both monarchs were shamed into joining the crusade and took up the cross in early 1188. Yet when Richard demanded that John accompany him, Henry refused. Leading Richard to believe and encouraged by the French king that Henry was seeking to disinherit him in favor of John. The nobles on the French side were eager to get the crusade going, as this quote from the annals of Roger of Howden tells us. The Earl of Flanders, however, and Earl Theobald, and other earls and barons of the Kingdom of France laid down their arms, saying that they would never bear arms against Christians until they should have returned from their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Richard, now firmly believing that his father planned to replace him with John as heir, sided with the French king and even performed homage to him for land still in Henry's control, forcing the issue of inheritance, as King Henry's succession plan was ambiguous, never outright stating that Richard was his heir. The situation deteriorated into a war between father and son. Once again, King Henry was to face a son and the French king together, but this would be the last time. In the spring of 1189, one final peace conference was held to avoid open hostilities. On the day of the conference, the King of France and the King of England, Earl Richard, the Cardinal John, and the four archbishops before mentioned, who had been chosen for the purpose, and the earls and barons of the two kingdoms, met for a conference near Le Ferté Bernard. At this conference, the King of France demanded of the King of England, his sister Alice, to be given in marriage to Richard, Earl of Poitou, and that fealty for his dominions should be sworn to the said Richard, and that his brother John, assuming the cross, 
should set out for Jerusalem. To this, the King of England made answer that he would never consent to such a proposal, and offered the King of France, if he should think fit, to assert thereto to give the said Alice in marriage to his son John, with all the matters previously mentioned more at large, more fully and more completely than the king demanded. The king of France would not agree to this. With the negotiations failing, the French king left with Richard and they quickly captured several castles around Le Mans. Henry, meanwhile, was resting at Le Mans, becoming increasingly ill. And before long, Philip's army was preparing to assault the walls of the city. Yet, in one case, either the defenders or the governor of Anjou set fires to the outskirts of the city to hold off the invading army. But the fire was blown back further into the city. The French army then moved towards a stone bridge, which Henry's smaller army tried to pull down. A bloody clash was fought on the bridge, with heavy death tolls on both sides. Henry's bastard son Geoffrey was wounded in the thigh and captured. The bloody attack by the French broke through, and what remained of Henry's army hurriedly fled into the city, with the French army pursuing them. Henry had promised the citizens that he would never abandon the city of which his father is laid to rest as well as his own birthplace. But the situation was desperate for Henry, and to avoid certain capture or death, he had to flee the city with a small force of mounted knights. The French army gave chase, but were checked by a deep ford in the river. Henry fled to Chinon. As for John, there is no mention of him or what he was up to. As Henry fled, his rearguard was commanded by William Marshall. While covering the retreat, William faced Richard on horseback. The encounter went as the following. William brought down his spear and charged at Richard. Richard cried out, God's feet, Marshall! Slay me not! I have no halberk! William responded while charging, Slay you? No, I leave that to the devil! Immediately after shouting this, William thrusted his spear into Richard's horse's neck, killing it. With the horse dead, William left Richard behind, mountless. Back to King Henry. After a few miles of galloping, Henry and his men rested upon a hill overlooking the now burning city. Henry is reported to have said the following, O oh God, thou hast shamefully taken from me this day the city which I loved most on earth, in which I was born and bred, where lies the body of my father and that of his patron saint. I requite thee as I can. I will withdraw from thee that thing in me for which thou carest the most. After a period of rest, Henry's plan was to head to Normandy to gather more troops to continue the fight. Yet, along the way, Henry suddenly turned around and headed back towards Anjou to the surprise of his retinue. He was ill and perhaps felt like he was dying and wanted the comforts of home or nearest to it. Avoiding enemy forces along the way, Henry made it to Chinon, exhausted from illness and the summer heat. Meanwhile, Philip and Richard were making lightning progress in capturing towns and castles, while Henry lay dying in bed, and by July the 3rd, Henry met the two. Richard had not believed the tales of his father being deathly ill, but upon seeing how weak and fragile his father was, felt remorse. Henry was now being supported on horseback by two servants. Shocked by this, Philip and Richard offered a cloak to be laid upon the ground for the weary monarch to rest on. King Henry refused the offer and demanded what terms they wanted to present, as Henry was in no position to refuse. After agreeing to the terms, 
Henry is said to have whispered into Richard's ear during the kiss of peace. God, grant that I may not die until I have had my revenge on you. Before Henry left, he asked a list to be drawn up with the names of those who left him for Philip or Richard. The Chronicles of Roger of Howden give us one story of what happened next. This being accordingly done, he found the name of his son John written at the beginning of the list. Surprised at this beyond measure, he came to Chinon and, touched with grief at heart, cursed the day on which he was born and pronounced upon his sons the curse of God and of himself, which he would never withdraw, although bishops and other religious men frequently admonished him so to do. Being sick even until death, he ordered himself to be carried into the church, before the altar, and there devoutly received the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And after confessing his sins and being absolved by the bishop and clergy, he departed this life in the 35th year of his reign, on the octave of the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul, being the fifth day of the week after a reign of 34 years, 7 months and 4 days. King Henry was one of the greatest monarchs of the High Middle Ages, embodying the quintessential traits and personality of what defies a High Middle Ages king. His last two legitimate sons only contained half of what made their father a successful medieval monarch, and his curse upon his sons would come true.